this presentation is to give you guys a lot of things to think about for what you're going to be working on this week. So I'm going to start with this camera, which if anyone has been through Gatwick or Manchester Airport in England, you may have seen one of these. Uh, the way that it works, it has this LED pattern that spins around and it's mounted, you know, on the ceiling. So when you're walking around the airport, you look at this and wonder, what is this, what is this pattern? As soon as you look up at it, it captures your face and it has your face, your face print, your face template. So then that's used to track you around the airport. Um, and it's used for what they would say is traffic flow measurement. So measuring people, you know, around the airport to figure out where there are too many people, where we need to dedicate staff to alleviate uh, too many people. But it's an example of, of the way that cameras are used now, which I think, and I'll argue in this presentation, is more about uh, treating people as data. It's a, a machinic way of looking at each other, a machinic way of looking at people. And if we look back to the very beginning of photography, so 1850, you know, 160 years ago now, um, we're looking at uh, literally a photograph where we make a replica of the light in the visible spectrum. In other words, uh, the frequencies that your eye as a human is sensitive to, we're making recording, and that was called the photograph. We still use that term today, but we use it in a way that's not well suited to talk about what is being captured, what is being stored, how it's being analyzed, and what kind of data is being extracted from that. And so on the right, you have a diagram of a neural network, a deep learning system that not only looks at that moment as a representation, you know, as a capture of light, but it also looks at the reference to other media. So one image is not alone, an image has a relation to other media. And so when you, when you analyze a photo, when you present a photo uh, to one of these systems, it, it never exists alone. And the more referential data points you have, of course this is how big data works, the more that can be inferred and the more that can be extracted from that image. And I'll go over some uh, state-of-the-art examples during this talk. So, Tanya Ali described a little bit about what I do. Um, I am not a camouflage artist in the sense that I don't design camouflage. Um, because what I think most people think of when you say camouflage is something that looks like this. And on the left is the M81 woodland pattern which was designed in 1948. It wasn't put into use until uh, the 1960s in the Vietnam War in the context of jungle warfare. Uh, that camouflage pattern has become the most iconic representation of camouflage, but also, uh, as the most popular, it's also the most misleading. The one on the other side, in the fluorescent orange, uh, you may have seen a hunter wearing this one. And what's interesting here is that now camouflage has um, been designed in a, in a dual, dual perception type of way. So you see fluorescent orange and it's highly visible to you. Um, and you also see the patterns of the trees or the leaves in it. But the way that it works is you appear in one way to other people and you appear in a different way to the animal uh, that's being hunted. So in this case, it's deer, and deer can't see fluorescent orange, so deer see gray. And so you're able to exist in two perceptual states. And I think um, that's essential for the way of looking at what camouflage means today uh, in a world where we're not 
we're not in the jungle, right? The only thing that M81 Woodland blends into anymore is itself, somebody else wearing the same pattern. Now to, before I get into some of the work that I've done and some of the work that uh, researchers are developing, you know, actively to, uh, to further the state of the art computer vision, I think it's helpful to have a little bit of grounding in face perception technologies. Uh, by face perception, I mean you know, uh, face recognition or facial expression analysis. So it's quite old, actually it goes all the way back to 1969 when three Japanese researchers uh, detected the first human face with a computer algorithm. And it looked uh, something like this. It was replicated in 1970 at Stanford. So this is kind of like the first uh, computer cave drawing of a computer recognizing what a face looks like. And it's a little bit like a piece of broccoli or a light bulb. It's a very primitive interpretation of the face. And to an engineer, you would say, they would say it's not very robust. You know, it's very brittle, uh, weak. That could be a lot of things. It's not a very accurate or precise representation of all the different things that a face could be. A face could have a hat on it, a face could have glasses on it, and so forth. Um, and so meanwhile, in Japan and at Stanford University in California, the race was on uh, for developing face perception technologies. And as early as 1970, um, researchers were able to identify, you can see these little um, dots, these are called landmarks, facial landmarks. They're able to identify facial landmarks and it, by 1973, do facial recognition. So 1973 was really the first time that computers were used to use a face, your face, as the index to your identity. In the same way that you have maybe a passport number, and that's an index to your identity, to who you are. Or maybe your name is obviously also an index to your identity, but what, what researchers wanted to do is to use your face as, as your name, as your passport number. So then between the 70s and 80s, people realized that this is actually really uh, difficult to do, given the computers and the computational resources during that time. Carrying out facial recognition uh, beyond recognizing a head that looks like a piece of broccoli is actually really, really hard. So in the 1990s, the U.S. Department of Defense, Counter-Drug Department, and DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research <coughs> Projects Agency, carried out FERRET. Uh, FERRET is an acronym for Face Recognition Technology. And what's interesting about the FERRET program is that it was the first time that a government agency had put together a database of people to train, test, and validate a facial recognition algorithm. So the point of FERRET was, you know, at this point nobody knew maybe facial recognition was complete garbage. Um, FERRET was designed to figure out whether we're going to pursue facial, facial recognition as a technology that would be integrated with law enforcement uh, with a defense program, with um, counter-drug uh, task force, and so on. And, of course, now we know that it was successful in, you know, at least proving, demonstrating that there's potential here. Um, it was not a solved problem. It was very, uh, I mean, the percentages were like, still in the 70s and 80s, which is not really acceptable. But that idea of gathering a database of people and using it to train, test, and validate, that ferret was the first time that that had really taken place. So, you know, based on the initial success of that, right away, companies in the U.S. started 
creating this technology and selling it to the government before it had actually been vetted. And there are some interesting case studies about how that was not really a good idea because uh, the technology doesn't work and you're selling it to law enforcement, you know, in the counter drug department and so on. Um, generally, you would want them to have things that function correctly. So then in, in the following years, in 2000, 2002, in 2006, there were three more variations of that test that were run, um, and these are called facial recognition uh, vendor. Vendor is kind of like a, you know an external company a contractor for the government. So after the government had established in in the mid 90s that this was good, now it, it opened up to uh, government contractors. And so this facial recognition vendor test. Uh, was carried out and again successfully through the early 2000s and it got a huge huge push right after 9-11 from what was called the Total Information Awareness Program or TIA. Uh, TIA wasn't the only program uh, doing this at the time but it was the program where all the money went and all the money went towards biometrics especially biometrics at a distance, meaning I can use your face as an index to your identity, to who you are, but I can do it remotely. I can do it from here to the third row, you do it from here to the last row, and I can even do it from here a few hundred meters with a telephoto lens. And possibly I could even do it from a satellite photo. And these, these are the technologies that the government wanted. Uh, generally, the goal of this program was to recognize anybody at 100 meters using any technology that you can. Any way you want to do that, go ahead. <laughs> uh, and some of the ways that people came up with, it's not, it's not only about faces. Um, well, some of the work that I do is, is mostly you know, about how to, how to conceal or modulate the visibility of your face, but if you look at all the different technologies in this program, it's what you'd call a multimodal approach or a fused biometric. And what that means is well, you take the face and you take the iris and you do the ears and you look at the way somebody's standing and you look at the clothes they're wearing and you look at what they, how they appear in infrared and you look at how they appear in thermal and so on. And you look at their fingerprints, and you look at their gestures, their hair, everything that you can. Uh, and that's what's called a fused biometric. So you compile all that information together. Now you have a very robust index to someone's identity.